All right. Welcome to the podcast, Kristen. It's so good to have you. It's so good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes. And so uh, we we connected on, on Facebook, on social media, and uh, I a few months ago, you wrote a, 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 a really helpful article about uh, healing uh, uh, in, in family. And so I want to uh, talk to you more about that today and uh, learn more about uh, your, your writing. You, you, you do lots of uh, writing and um, yeah. And then we're going to do a two-part episode uh, with you. Um, our second episode is going to be uh, talking about parenting and, and motherhood. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, as we start, can you share your, your background? Yeah. So I was raised um, in Southern California. I am the oldest child. There is just two of us, me and my sister, who's four years younger. And we moved um, a lot as I was growing up. Um, job changes and just parents looking for a new adventure, all sorts of reasons that we moved. But we were kiddos that were very used to change. Um, whenever we were called for a family meeting, we knew that the announcement was going to be, we're moving. Um, so I have up to this point in my life moved 24 times wow. and, um, it was mostly small moves around California. Um, but my parents were always looking for something that might provide happiness. They were chasing the next adventure or just a change. Um, because I think their souls were just really searching. I was not raised in a home of faith. Uh, my dad was and still is to this day an atheist. And my mom was raised in a really strict Catholic home, um, but she wasn't practicing any longer. So um, I didn't have any conversations of faith growing up, um, but we did live in a home of a lot of chaos. Um, there was a lot of fighting, a lot of loudness, um, yelling and screaming. And then it seemed like when people weren't yelling and screaming, we were giving the silent treatment. Um, so it was a home where I learned as a little girl to protect myself. Um, and I really didn't realize the extent of all I was enduring until I was a grown up because, you know, I think like so many people, when you're a kid, you don't really realize what's normal and what's not. And it wasn't until I had a friend in the seventh grade. Her dad was a pastor of a little plant, local plant church, and he um, they would invite me to spend the night on Saturday nights. And then I would go to church with him on Sunday morning. And that was my first exposure to faith, but I was super confused at that point. Um, didn't really know what I was hearing. And then no surprise, we moved again. I um, moved away from that friend um, from California to Colorado. And um, Colorado is where my parents um, eventually did divorce, but it was long and it was nasty. It was a multi-year process that resulted in threats and all sorts of things that um, made for some restraining orders and resulted in me not seeing my dad for 12 years. Um, there were no conversations, there were no visits. And I just, uh, being a young teenager and throughout all of this, as it started to happen, I started coping in some really unhealthy ways. Um, and just went more and more inside of myself. My mom was, had always been emotionally distant, but she became even more so. And it was kind of every man for himself in our house. Mm. Um, my youngest sister started really struggling and she became my job to take care of, um, according to my mom. So I was serving as a little mama um, when I was also trying to mother myself at that point. Um, so just a lot of loneliness and darkness at that point. And I eventually went away to college where I was continuing to make a lot of really poor choices for myself and 
um, didn't realize how much I was acting out and of just a need for love and closeness in my life. And the Holy Spirit just grabbed a hold of me. I was um, at CU, the University of Colorado. And at that time, it was a very big party school. And so people kind of laugh when I tell them that I became a Christian at CU because it's like the most unlikely of places, but I feel That's like- not what happened. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is where God loves to work in the unlikely places. And um, he just grabbed a hold of my heart and I knew that I needed to follow a different path. And I started by myself going to local campus church and started just learning and falling in love with this father who I learned had not abandoned me. And um, that was a huge turning point in my life. Around that same time, I also started dating my now husband. Um, and so God was up to a lot of changes at that point for me and he was raised a Christian and, um, he would marvel at all the ways that I was excited about faith and the questions I had and just the intensity of it for me, because for him, it was just something he was raised with and he was really used to it. Um, but I was new and had so many questions. And so we actually learned a lot together in our faith walk at that point. Um, and then we have just had a not boring marriage and years of young parenting. And um, we've been married for 15 years now. So our kids are getting older and our marriage is getting older. And we have learned a ton that this, the Lord has taught us and been gracious with us. Um, but maybe I'll save some of that for other things that we dive into. Yeah. So with uh, growing up uh, in your uh, high school, high school years, mm -hmm. your, um, your father wasn't in your life anymore. And, and your sister's four years younger, you had to, yes. yeah. Um, having that responsibility put on you, how did, how did that affect you, Kristen, going through high school? It really put a big strain on my sister and I's relationship. And so that, um, we were always pitted against each other from my parents' perspective. They would pit us against each other. Um, and so we never had a great relationship, but that really was really hard. And so that felt like a loss. Um, and it also felt like, um, gosh, I don't know if, if unfair is the word, but I felt like I was always dealing with more than my peers were. Um, and so there was a piece of me that felt resentful about it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other piece of me was too busy growing up really fast to, even think much about it because a lot of it just felt like survival for she and I. Mm, yeah. So, uh, lots of, uh, responsibility, just pressure or, or weight to, to carry. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, with, uh, the, the challenges that you, um, had, uh, in college, uh, b before you, you came to faith, um, what, uh, who, who were you becoming? Before I came to faith, gosh, I don't like to think about who I was becoming. Um, I think I was a picture of desperation. I just so badly wanted to be known and to be loved that I was willing to be friends with, to date, to go to parties with, really whomever I perceived to be taking a notice or um, paying any attention. Um, and I, I think I didn't know who I was and I wasn't thinking about who I was becoming. I was moment by moment just trying to satisfy those needs and those longings. Yeah. So the 
you were really re reacting to how people were responding to you. You you weren't necessarily making uh, decisions or healthy and or healthy decisions. You're just wanting to connect and yes and, yeah. and be seen. Yeah. The um. Uh, at, at at one point you you realized you had to make a change, but before then were was it was it fun and and working for you or was it like were you struggling i was struggling i was i mean not only my soul was struggling but i think even physically i just i wasn't eating enough i wasn't sleeping anywhere near enough i was getting sick constantly mm -hmm. and so inside and outside i think probably to onlookers it was obvious i was not doing well the uh can can you say more uh, about the lessons that you were learning as, as a couple yeah absolutely my husband and i um we <laughs> it's taken us 15 years to learn a lot of these lessons but we have learned that some of our primary differences um because we align like um, we always say all the things that matter all the the big things like faith and how we want to raise kids and you know things that we value we align but then on all the little things we just could not be more different of people and god is has a good sense of humor and it's hilarious like that but um we one of our biggest struggles has always been our communication and so one of the things we've been learning is that i am an external processor and he is an internal processor. And it took me a really long time to realize that when he needed some time to think about the conversation we were having or the fight that we were having, it wasn't because he was purposely trying to stall and make me so mad. It was because he genuinely needed time to process and to think about it. And so while he was frustrating me, I think I was suffocating him because I wanted an answer or I wanted to continue the conversation right now. And so just that understanding that we've developed about each other has helped tremendously. And not only is it a difference of internal versus external processing for us, it's been um, emotional versus very it's like the emotion side is down here and the logic and thinking is up here. We just could not be further apart from each other. And it really comes out a lot in how we talk to each other. And we have been like slowly learning how to inch towards and make steps towards the other one. But when he would just say, I'm sorry, he really meant he was sorry, but it felt cold to me and it didn't feel genuine. And so now he's learned he'll like physically come towards me and put his hand on my knee. And I am so sorry. I can really tell I hurt your feelings. I'm sorry that I said it in that way. And for me, that makes all of the difference in the world. But for him, he needs the opposite. When I would go on and on and tell him all of my feelings and all of my thoughts before it was like overload for him. And so now I just tone it down into a couple of short sentences mm. and he is like, thank you for <laughs> communicating in the way that he can receive it. So we're learning a lot of communication lessons. Yeah. yeah. It, when, uh, when you have those, uh, uh extreme differences, uh, you both, uh, don't get what you need, um, w w without some hard work. Um, so he, he needed more bite-sized pieces from you. Mm -hmm. to, to not feel overwhelmed and you needed more more warmth and and connection um, exactly yeah it's um I, I i like what you said when uh folks that are more logical uh share um they they really mean it but it uh to their partner it doesn't seem genuine exactly and, and um and so uh with time and lots of practice and maybe some hurt feelings he, he, he learn like no he actually really does care and really mean what he's saying yes um, yeah the uh, uh with uh, the, the the differences in um your your personality 
uh, what other uh, what um, topics or or um, or situations have been like challenging? Yeah, we find yeah. that we, especially in the beginning of our marriage, we had a lot of unspoken expectations, which meant a lot of unmet expectations. And um, we laugh about it now, but when we were planning our honeymoon together, we were going to be going to Italy. And that was back before like Expedia was available and doing all the great things. And so it was like really combing through your options. And he didn't realize that I had, um, I wasn't communicating. So I had never been on a real big vacation like that. I've been camping a couple of times when I was younger, but never, you know, a real big vacation. And he had been traveling ever since he was young. And so for him, when he traveled with his family, the, the vacation was the experiences and for me, never having really stayed in any hotels, I thought that was like the most fabulous thing. And so I was very concentrated on like, are you kidding me? We get to be in a hotel and look at this. And so we just were concentrated on totally different things. And it made for some unfortunate conversations in our vacation planning. But once we were able to kind of realize, okay, we're expecting totally different things out of this trip and let's sort this out. Um, we got on the same page, but uh, that has come up when in a lot of different ways. I mean, holidays, I think is a huge breeding ground for unmet expectations. When our first holidays or tree or, you know, real tree or pretend tree yeah. and <laughs> all those little nuances, you know, the blueprint that we bring with us from our childhood and the relationships that we've had and the beliefs that we hold and all those things that, that like add up to this blueprint package of us and that we don't do a good job communicating to the other person, I think, um, provide all those opportunities for unspoken or unmet expectations. Yeah. I, I, I like that, that phrase, uh, a blueprint package, the, like the, the blueprint. And so much of that blueprint is from our family of origin. And so the, can, can you say a little bit about um, breaking a bad family cycle? Like yeah. how, um, how are you doing things differently with your marriage and family and, and, or, or before that, how has the past affected you and your family? So I went to counseling for the very first time in my life in between our, um, kiddos number two and three. So right now, they are eight years old and 11 years old. And cause we had lost a baby for the first time and I was just undone. I was not okay. And, um, so I thought I was going to counseling about that. And it turned out I was able to grieve that in a healthy way and process through that. And what I really needed to spend most of my counseling sessions on was all of the, um, you know, I think the counseling world refers to it as little T trauma that I had incurred when I was younger. Um, you know, that big T trauma is things like a car accident or, um, you know, major episode of sexual abuse or something that you can think of as, you know, a mass shooting um, as a, a big event that occurred in Little T is all the little traumas like bullying or um, an emotionally distant parent, um, things like that that have occurred. And there were all things that I had brushed aside and reasoned with myself that that behavior pattern from my mom was normal or that thought pattern that I inherited from my dad um, uh, you know, maybe he's just a little kooky. You know, I just brushed things off and didn't really 
realize what the whole package of that had done to my heart and done to my soul mm. and till I was in counseling. And so I've, for the last two years, I've done a bunch of EMDR and what that has meant for me is that I can now have these situations that occur and I don't have an enormous big reaction to it. That's really a reaction to the trauma that it's triggering. Like, for example, when my husband, um, he used to have to work late a lot and when he would come home and he was exhausted and he just was too tired to really tell me about his day, it felt to me like he was rejecting me and that triggered an abandonment feeling in me. And so really he's just a tired guy at the end of the day, but my reaction was enormous because I felt abandoned all over again. But after doing EMDR, I can have that same situation. And now, you know, I, some of those feelings still come up for me, but I'm able to think about it and then respond in a much healthier and more appropriate way. It, 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 there's still some feelings. It doesn't take them away, but they're not so intense or overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. And besides the emotions Kristen did did it change the way you 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 see see yourself or the things that you you tell yourself yeah it's changed um I would say it's changed my identity in that I've come to understand that me putting up boundaries in my relationships and in my life um is not something that's unloving of me or mean, but really it's both loving to myself and mm -hmm. it is a really loving way for me to protect my kids and to protect my family. Um, and also it's the only way that I can keep doing the work that Jesus has set for me to do. Because when I was spending all of my emotional energy and my time and my patience, my bandwidth, wrapped up in a reaction from somebody or maybe an abandonment I perceived um, or you know, just time wrapped up in those really big emotions, then I'm not able to wife or mom or be a friend or really do anything very well. Um, definitely not to the extent that I know Jesus would have for me. Yeah. The so, so for, for you taking that step to, to go to counseling, that, that, that was really helpful. Um, uh, and anything else uh, 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 along the way that, that was, was helpful with, uh, with, with healing? Yeah. Um, I think that the step of going to counseling, um, it was so big, not just because it ended up being so helpful, but it kind of broke down a barrier of um, perception that I held about mental health and what struggling with your mental health implied about you. Mm -hmm. um, I had grown up with my family's belief that if you are depressed, um, you're putting on a show. Um, or if you are anxious, you're being dramatic. Mm. Um, so they definitely held the belief that these were things that weren't real and um, said something really negative about you. Uh, so me going to counseling was a step away from that belief and um, through that barrier, um, which was huge. And it ended up being having a domino effect that after I was able to uh, start believing new things about myself and my mental health, I was also able to be more, more open to different treatment, open to the MDR, open to taking the medicines that my body needed. Um, and so it tremendously changed my path forward and I had no idea that my mentality changing 
on mental health would be so necessary for our kiddos. When our um, oldest, who's now 13, when he was 10, um, he had just been struggling so badly and with anxiety and depression and OCD, but I did not realize the extent to which he had been struggling. Mm -hmm. And his counselor told me, I think it's time that we talk about medication. And my husband and I prayed about it and we felt at peace with it. And so we took him in and it was at that first appointment with a psychiatrist that um, she said, asked him, have you been having any thoughts of hurting yourself? And he said so bravely, yeah, I've I've been having thoughts of killing myself. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, that's every mom's worst nightmare of something to hear from their child's lips. Um, And my initial uh, physical response was tears, uh, but I was like, Kristen, this moment is about his bravery. And so I just sat with him and held his hand and reassured him that he was so brave and I was so proud of him. And I know that was the opposite of a response that I probably would have received um, when I was growing up. But in that moment, I just felt so grateful that I had been shown a completely new way of thinking about mental health and approaching mental health and that my heart had been prepared for a couple of years prior to that to be ready to love him well through it. That's that's such a a, a powerful moment, Um, not not just for him, but for for you too. in in our in part two, I'll I'll want to ask more about uh, how, how to support your your, your children um, when when they struggle uh, as a mom, but I want to um, go a, a little deeper uh, into the the article that you wrote about uh, breaking uh, uh, like a bad family cycle. Yes. Like, yeah. Um, uh, how, how did you start, um, b- before we dive into it, how did you start r- writing, uh, uh, yes. uh, about family and identity and, and, and mental health? I started writing about eight years ago now, um, as an act of obedience. I had been leading a MOPS group, it stands for Mothers of Preschoolers. Um, I'd been leading a MOPS group at the time and leading women through this really vulnerable time. And I just recognized a lot of the things that I had struggled with and a lot of the places that God had shown redemption in my life were the same areas that a lot of these other women were struggling with. And I just kept feeling a pull um, to want to do more for them, to want to help them. And so that's where my writing was born. And I have felt from the beginning that if it is a hard topic to talk about, um, if maybe some of it has an element of shame to me, um, or yeah, just something that feels like it's probably the last thing that you would want to bring up in a conversation. That's what I'm supposed to be writing about. And, um, that's what I'm, that's, uh, like the really beautiful silver lining. I feel like that God has given me to a bunch of these harder situations that I've been through is that now through writing, I'm able to help other people through them. Mm -hmm. That's that, that sounds so scary to me. (laughs) <laughs> like the, 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 the one thing that you don't want to talk about, I'm going to write about that. I'm going to share that. Wow. Yeah. The, um, so, uh, the, the uh, I'm going to put the link to the article, but can you uh, share a little bit about the, the different elements of, of breaking a bad family cycle? Yes. So I mentioned a little bit earlier that I learned to start putting boundaries in place. Um, But one of the most significant times that I have had to put a boundary in place 
was uh, about two and a half years ago now. We were getting ready for a move to Texas from Colorado and we, our house was up for sale. And you know what that's like with little kids and you're trying to show a house and you're constantly having to leave it. So it's just a little bit chaotic. Mm. And we got a phone call from my sister. Um, it's a longer story, but my mom um, was needing to leave her house and my mom had been living with my sister. And so uh, we got a couple hours notice to my mom moving in with us. And um, it was something that, you know, we didn't think twice about and we were happy to do, but it's just a big change for a family. And um, so my mom moved in with us and she has not made um, the same changes in how she views taking care of your mental health as um, I have. And um, and my sister has, my sister is actually a psych nurse now. Um, but she, my mom um, was struggling a lot with different things. She was struggling with anxiety and depression and um, she was not in a good place. And it was becoming a very toxic situation and um, saving details for protecting her a little bit. Um, it was just becoming a situation that was not livable um, for us. And I knew that I had to make the choice that was never made for me when I was younger. Um, no one made choices that protected me. Um, from adults that were making unsafe choices when I was growing up and um, I couldn't be the next step in that generational story that was continuing to tell the same unhealthy story. Um, so I had to ask my mom to leave our home and that was a boundary that I knew my marriage needed and my kids most of all needed um, but it was also devastating. It was such a hard choice to have to make when I knew she didn't have anywhere to go. Um, and so it has been a multi-year healing process of um, some counselor assisted conversations and just really a lot of prayer and a lot of careful conversations um, that has stepped my mom and I back towards um, a relationship but that was a boundary that, um, gosh, I wouldn't wish it upon anyone else, but I would also wish that anyone else in the same situation would be able to make that choice for their kids and to end a cycle um, that was either just unhealthy then, or as is true in my case, and I think is true in so many people's cases that has been going on for generations and generations. It was something, um, a lot of just unhealthy behaviors and thoughts that I saw in my grandparents that were passed on down to my mom and that were being passed on to me to some extent. And I knew that that just had to be the end. We just had to make different choices. Um, and so, all of that to say, that was my motivation in writing the article, that I just want people who um, feel like a hopeless, stuck feeling from all these um, things that they've inherited. I think a mental health plays a huge role in it, um, but behavior and thought patterns also. I just want them to feel the freedom and the courage that change is possible, that this is not a hopeless situation, that you are not de destined to become an unhealthy parent you might have had, or your kids aren't destined to be sitting in the counselor's office with the same pain that you had, mm -hmm. um, that you can make different choices and there can be a different story told in your family. So that was my motivation in writing about my process. Um, the article is about my process of having some holy lament, just going through grief and 
than what that looks like and to not feel ashamed about the grief that you're going through um, and then redefining my identity getting real about my mental health and being honest with myself and then um, learning to really advocate well for myself and for my family yeah and with that just writing and and creating a new uh, legacy for, for for your family um, yeah i want to go back to the the uh be behavior and thought patterns that can get passed down and and, and inherited for, mm -hmm. for for you Kristen, if you're comfortable sharing what do you think were some of the like uh beliefs or thought patterns that were were in your family that that you're that you're changing yeah um well mental health was a big one um also having a faith in um how we view faith has been i would say the biggest game changer um and then there's also things that are seemingly little but then also when they play out they're really not little at all like um a just a general mistrust of other people um and so a an emotional protection of shutting off and closing yourself off to anybody else not trusting that anybody would have um good intentions or your best in mind um that's huge it did that affect your trust and closeness with your husband yes yeah it has um he has actually said on many occasions, I don't feel like you remember or that you're always remembering, I have your best in mind. Mm -hmm. And he unfortunately has been right. Um, it's been hard for me to trust that somebody would continuously have my best in mind. Yeah. He's, he's really had to fight for that and, and, and prove it to you for sure. Yeah. And just consistently show that to you. Uh -huh. Yeah. The um, earlier you said like you, you had unity or, or like uh, or, or like the, on the big things, uh -huh. the, the, the big priorities and values and, and your faith. Uh, but it is so many of those little things that can can make communication and and marriage hard. Um, like and feeling safe and, and trust. So many of those little differences can, can yeah. be in there. If you have that filter or core message, any little thing like, oh, yep, no, but like th there's more evidence for how I have to, I can't trust you fully. Um, yes. Yeah, it almost puts you looking for the negative instead of just resting in the trust that that they have your best intention in mind. Mm. Yeah. So be, besides your husband, what have been way, um, ways where, um, or, or even people that have helped you with that? Um, I would, there's been a few friends that God has put in my life. Um, and I will admit that these friends came after friendships. Um, I don't want to say that they necessarily failed, uh, friendships that came and went. And I struggled a lot with the ending of these friendships and what must that say about me? Mm. And um, until these new friends came along and they kind of called me out on guarding myself in certain situations. And I was taken aback, but then I just admitted to him, you know, this is how things have played out for me in the past. And it's hard for me to trust that if I told you my full truth, that you wouldn't run or that you would still want to be my friend. And, um, 
and their reaction of such surprise that I would even think that way, I think was like just one of the best ways for my heart to feel loved. Um, it really grew my trust that no, like not every relationship, not every person is going to run. Wow. They, that, and that, that they really love you and yeah. that they're there for you. Wow. Yeah. Um, everybody needs friends like that. Yes, we do. Yeah. yeah. It's the yeah. best gift. Yeah. So, uh, with it, it, you've been involved with, with mops and, and you've been writing for a few years. Are, are there other, uh, uh, organizations or, or, uh, areas that, that you do ministry in? Yes. So when I, um, I was involved with MOPS as a participant for nine years, and then um, MOPS is actually based in Denver, Colorado. And when we lived there, I started working for them as their director of development, and which meant I got to help fundraise because um, they are a nonprofit. And uh, I loved every moment of it. I think not everyone is created to love fundraising, but there is just something special about getting to marry the relationship of here's somebody that faithfully um, and for spiritual reasons really wants to give of their time and their treasure. And then you have an organization that needs it and being able to match those two together um, doesn't really feel like an ask. It feels like a really great in um, harmonious relationships. So, um, so I fell in love with fundraising for nonprofits, um, Christian ones specifically. And so right now I, um, as I primarily stay home with my kids, um, but in addition to writing and speaking, I also um, do some work for a nonprofit called People Prosper International. And um, they are helping to end poverty around the world, but in the Philippines, in Haiti, and Kenya right now. Mm. Um, and so I get to still flex that fundraising muscle a little bit. Do, do you get to travel to those places? We have started talking to, about that, but I have not gone yet. Well, COVID is making that a little difficult right now, but <laughs> yeah. eventually th nice. that's the hope. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my, my mom's Filipino and uh, I, I had a chance to bring my son uh, there. Uh, I think he was probably 14, 15 year, years old uh, when, when we went. And so it, it, it was, it was nice to, to, to be able to, to, to go and, and help at a, a orphanage um, and school oh, there. That's an experience uh, of a lifetime. That's awesome. Yeah, it was great. Um, as we kind of uh, wind down our, our time for uh, th this episode, is there anything that you'd like to, to share with, with listeners? I just want to underscore what I was talking about before in the hope. Um, there is no situation that is so broken, that is so lost, that is so beyond any boundaries you could put in place at this point um, that, um, that is just hopeless. And I would say that I believed for a long time about a lot of my situations uh, that they were hopeless. And sometimes I was faithful that God was going to turn it around. And sometimes I was not. If we have time for one quick little story, I'll share. Um, I had spent six years with some chronic pelvic pain after some really difficult birds. And uh, then I herniated two discs. And I was just in extreme physical pain mm -hmm. and, um, no amount of pain medicine was making it better. Nerve injections, uh, physical therapy, everything that they tried was not making it better. And so eventually they scheduled me for spine surgery and it meant I wasn't going to be able to walk for many months and wasn't going to be able to mom. And I truly, I'm 
embarrassed to say now, but I just felt hopeless. I didn't even think God could turn it around at that point. And I couldn't imagine a life without that physical pain. And I went into surgery expecting to wake up from surgery in the same exact state. And I was refusing to pray. I think I was afraid of how am I going to feel if even God is not changing this? Um, and so I wasn't having faith, but I woke up from surgery and I did, you know, have to do the many months of physical therapy and the healing that came after it. But even when I showed such little faith, he was so faithful in healing. And I feel like that was a dramatic physical healing. Um, but I have seen evidence of him healing again and again and again in the story of um, my family and what's happening with us generationally. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to encourage you that no matter where you're at, or how many generations that your family has looked like this for, that um, you were created for such a time as this, and that there is always hope. Thank you so much, Kristen. That's, that's a, a, a great place uh, to end. Um, uh, I'll put uh, links to your, your writing, um, your website in, in the show notes um, and uh, encourage folks to, uh, to connect with you and, and, and uh, read more uh, about, about your story. That sounds wonderful. Thank you so much, Savan.